Good morning. My name is Ken Ferraro, and I'm director of the Center on Aging and the Life course at Purdue University. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you here this morning. Happy Friday. Our purpose today is to focus on avenues to optimal longevity. And we're delighted to see that you have come to participate in this endeavor. I see familiar faces from across campus, across the state, and in the region. So welcome. We're so delighted that you joined us. I believe many of you have had a chance to peruse the posters and to learn about some of the research projects that are going on here at Purdue. And those posters will be available at the break. There'll be a coffee refresh at about 10 o'clock and there'll be more opportunity for follow-up questions with our presenters. I want to thank the presenters for being here early this morning and helping us to get going. Very stimulating. Thank you very much. When I hear of people talking about the aging of our population as a problem, I wince. I have a hard time being quiet. Although the aging of our society presents some challenges, to me, population aging is a phenomenal success. It's one of the great public health achievements of our era. It's good news, and it's a startling public health success. We need to feel good about that. Once we have that vantage point, then I think it's time to think about the challenges that are faced by the aging of the population. But we have to begin with the axiom that this is really good news. And then how are we going to optimize the aging of our population? Those are important questions. Is there a compression of morbidity? What will adding years to life mean to individuals? Or do we want to also focus on adding years to life? What do we want to add? More years or more quality of life? What are the avenues to optimal longevity? That's what we want to focus on today. And our aim is evidence-based, not just can speculation or someone else's speculation, but what does the research show us in terms of ways that we can optimize the aging experience? Our speakers are exceptionally well-known and acclaimed nationally and internationally to help us think through those questions. For those of you who have pre-registered, you've got, you should have a booklet in front of you that I think will help you navigate the morning. Our speakers have provided some references, so if you'd like to read further on the topic, that uh, gives you some information. And at the conclusion of the morning, we will present our outstanding professor awards. I hope you'll stay with us to the end. We have some copies of the Aging Exchange, our uh, Center on the Aging and Life course newsletter. And if you haven't received that, uh, we have some of those in the hall. And if you'd like to be on the mailing list, just uh, drop your, maybe put your uh, name card in the recycle bin at the end of the day and just say mailing list and we'll, we'll take care of that. There are three organizations that work together to bring this uh, day to fruition. Obviously, the center played a, an integral role. Uh, secondly, the Department of Nutrition Science, which uh, I'm very pleased to say we have a good representation, both in the poster presentations. and uh, we, we were conscious, we were deliberate about the breakfast that we served you this morning. You didn't see any Krispy Kreme donuts. We really wanted to make sure that we got off to a healthy start. I express my thanks to the Department of Nutrition Science. And I also think about uh, the Purdue University Retirees Association that joined us as a co-sponsor. They have been uh, loosely affiliated and been participating in our symposium for a number of years, but the last two years they decided to step up and provide support for the symposium. So the lectures today are being video recorded and in a few weeks they will be available on our website and we, we know that professors are using those for instructional purposes and we really thank Pura for making that possible. I'd like to ask Dan Collins if he'd come. He's the president of Pura this year, if he'd just come and give us a greeting. Dan? 
Thanks, Ken, and certainly want to welcome all of you this morning. And what really is exciting for me, a number of things, but as I look around the room, and, and of course the, the, the posters are excellent, but I'm thinking, and, and this may be somewhat a function of my age too, but I'm seeing some people in here that might be like 19, 20, <laughs> and a few that are 90. So this appeals to those from the 19 to 90 range, at least. Uh, so on behalf of about 5,000 Purdue retirees, uh, and especially Sue Heiser, who's the chair of our endowment committee, the Retiree Association has an activity and opportunity endowment that, that is, um, allows us to, to help fund these types of programs. And, and that, too, is pretty exciting. That, that we're able to do this. We're, we're kind of unique among uh, our peer institutions in the relationship that our retiree association has with the, with the university and, and with, with some of the funding we've been able to, to accumulate over the years. PERA's mission uh, includes promoting retiring with a purpose and lifelong learning. So you kind of put those together, and as I tell people, I'm not really retired. I just don't get paid anymore. <laughs> and and that's that's pretty true. We, we try to stay active. We try to we we try to keep doing things. And w again, one of the ways we can do this is helping to sponsor these kind of programs. Uh, we do have, I won't ask you to raise your hand, but if you look around, you might be able to guess who our retirees in the audience might be. We do have a number of Purdue retirees here, um, which, which is great. So we also benefit because part of our mission is, is again, supporting these, these programs because we think we can help enrich the lives of not only our retiree members, but senior citizens generally and their families. Retirement's a partnership between the individual and the families that have to put up with us. So it's, it's a great opportunity and, and enjoy your morning. Yes, thank you, Para. Are you ready? I'm going to ask Dr. Patty Thomas to introduce our first speaker, get us uh, started this morning. Patty? Thank you, Ken. Dr. J. L. Shansky received his PhD in sociology at the University of Chicago in 1984. He is currently a professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Illinois at Chicago and research associate at the Center on Aging at the University of Chicago and at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. The focus of his research to date has been on estimates of the upper limits to human longevity, exploring the health and public policy implications associated with individual and population aging, forecasts of the size, survival, and age structure of the population, pursuit of the scientific means to slow aging in people, and global implications of the reemergence of infectious and parasitic diseases. His research has informed policy debates about important public issues, such as smoking, which his work may have helped get rid of the smoking, non-smoking sections, uh, and childhood obesity, in which his work informed Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign. Dr. Olshansky is on the board of directors of the American Federation of Aging Research, and he is the first author of The Quest for Immortality, Science at the Frontiers of Aging. He has been the keynote speaker at conferences all over the world, and he has published in a variety of, of journals, including Science, American Journal of Public Health, the Journal of the American Medical Association, the New England Journal of Medicine, Demography, and the Journals of Gerontology. Please join me in welcoming Dr. J. Olshansky. All right, um, I'm gonna, I'll break away from this uh, in a minute, but I wanna thank Ken for, uh, for inviting me here. It's an absolute uh, delight to be here and uh, and everyone should be supporting these aging programs uh, that exist, uh, you know, across 
uh, the United States and elsewhere. There's uh, really good work, really good research going on in these uh, in these aging centers. So uh, let's see. In order for me to get this operational, do I need to turn something on or do I just press forward? I wasn't sure how this is set up. So it looks blank to me. There we go. All right. Um, first of all, um, since we're at a university, uh, and I, I realize that we have a limited amount of time, uh, I actually really like questions. I love questions. So if anything strikes you while I'm giving the talk, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and let's try and address something as it comes up because I'm going to set forth some challenging ideas uh, over the next uh, 40 minutes or so. So uh, feel free to challenge back. That's half the fun. Uh, now, I've got a great story to tell you. Uh, and part of the story has to do with sort of the first comments uh, that, that you had made that, you know, between 19 and 90, well, guess what? We're all aging. And when we talk about aging, we're not just talking about, you know, people over the age of 60 or 70 or 80. We're talking about infants and children and, and newborns and everyone is going through this uh, process. The story I'm going to be telling you today is about some advances that I believe are forthcoming in the field of aging, aging science that are going to transform our concept, our concepts of aging, health, and longevity going forward in this century. But in order to understand why it is that my colleagues and I are making this argument, and why others have made this, it's important to step back and look back at history to give, a sense of, uh, give us a sense of how we got here. And so that's where I'm going to start out, and that's where I'm going to start the story. So uh, for those of us who study aging, who study longevity, who study mortality, uh, and particularly in my area, uh, for those of us who study demography, we look at the timing with which death occurs in a population. So this actually, it looks like a, you know, an average line drawn on a graph. This actually is one of the most famous lines that exists in the field of aging today. It actually tells an incredibly powerful story. It doesn't look like it, but, but it is. On the x-axis is age, and on the vertical axis is uh, death. Right? And so what this demonstrates is something that was demonstrated by a British actuary by the name of Benjamin Gompertz in 1825, uh, who, you know, his job was to find a way to figure out how to charge people for insurance premiums, right? And how do you do that? Do you charge everyone the same amount to, based on how old they are? Well, he discovered something that was actually pretty fascinating. By the way, ah, okay, I answered my own question. Do I have a laser pointer? All right, um, so what he discovered is, is that as we get older, the risk of death rises. This is on a semi-log scale, which means uh, this straight line represents an exponential increase in the risk of death with the passage of time. So roughly every eight years, the risk of death doubles. So this was a profound observation. Benjamin Gompert saw this in 1825. This served as the basis for, uh, for genera generating uh, estimates for insurance premiums. And he basically demonstrated that the older we get, the higher the risk of death. I mean, you and I, we all know this intuitively now, but in 1825, it wasn't obvious. Now, when Gompertz looked at this, he, he saw this same curve no matter where he looked, no matter what population he looked at, no matter what time period he looked at, it always looked exactly the same. Now, uh, for those of you in the back of the room, you're not going to be able to read this. And for those of you in the front of the room, I don't want you to read it. Um, but I put this up here for a reason. He used the phrase that I, I, want, I want to tell you about. When he saw that line and he saw the consistency with which it occurred, he said, I think I'm seeing a law, some sort of biological law that regulates how long we live, and the timing with which death occurs. He referred to it as the law of mortality. And when he thought of a law, he was thinking very much like Newton's law, that this was some sort of fundamental attribute of living things, that the longer they live, the higher the probability uh, that, uh, that death occurs. And as it turns out, Gompertz was not, not the only one. 
There were a large number of researchers since Gompertz, ever since Gompertz, which by the way was the title of a paper that I wrote, ever since Gompertz, who basically developed the same line of reasoning. So here is the same figure. There's Gompertz's line, by the way. You can see it right here. But what I did was I showed you, I'm um, showing you the timing with which death occurs. You know, it doesn't matter what time period you look at, you can go back, uh, uh, you know, 100 years, 500 years, and, and the, the, the death rates look exactly the same no matter when you look, no matter where you look. High infant mortality, the risk of death declines to its lowest point at puberty, always. And then the risk of death rises exponentially thereafter. We call it the J-curve, the J-shaped curve. It looks the same everywhere you go. And actually, as it turns out, it looks the same for dogs, for mice, for elephants, uh, for a wide variety of sexually reproducing species. The J-curve is famous for those of us who study uh, aging and mortality. This tells you that there's a constant, that something is happening to us in the same way that it's happening to your pets and to zoo animals and to almost all living things. Gompertz was right. There is the equivalent of a law of mortality. Understanding this, by the way, once you understand Gompertz's law and you understanding the timing with which death occurs, you then realize that we placed ourselves in a very unusual scenario in this modern era, the one that the two of you were referring to earlier about you know, the privilege of living this uh, long life. It is a privilege indeed, but there's a price we've had to pay for this. And I'll, and I'll get to that um, in a moment. So I'm not going to go into detail on any of the other figures involved except Raymond Pearl. Raymond Pearl uh, was a well-known researcher from Johns Hopkins in the early part of the 20th century. And Raymond Pearl said, and I'm using his language, we are dealing here with qualitatively identical expressions of an obviously fundamental biological law. So Raymond Pearl said, look, if the timing of death occurs in a consistent way for humans, it should occur in a consistent way for, for fruit flies and for dogs and for mice. And if you can actually compare them on the same time scale, all of the death rates for all of these species should overlap perfectly, if, if it's a law. Okay? So he, he tried to do this. He tried to compare the longevity of humans and Drosophila, or fruit fly. Fruit flies. And he basically divided the lifespan into these, into deciles, and he generated what's called a survival curve, the, the timing with which death occurs, and he didn't quite succeed. He came close. He wanted these lines to overlap. And if they overlap perfectly, um, he would have succeeded in documenting Gompertz's law of mortality. But he tried, and he tried hard, but he was unable to do it. Uh, now, as it turns out, my colleague Bruce Carnes and I picked up this uh, search for Gompertz's Law of Mortality in an article that we published in 1996, and we solved the problem. We now know what it was that Raymond Pearl did wrong and what it was that a number of other researchers, both before and after him, did wrong. It was actually incredibly simple. Ga uh, Raymond Pearl and many of the other researchers used something that we refer to as total mortality or all causes of death. But all, not all causes of death are related to aging. There are some causes of death that are completely unrelated to aging, like some that are associated with infectious diseases and some are associated with accidents and homicide and suicide. And so all we did, to make a long story short, was we eliminated all of these, what we refer to as extrinsic causes of death, and we, we removed the contamination that exists in these death rates. And we then compared the death rates for these different species across time. And lo and behold, we uh, came upon the solution for Gompertz's law. Uh, this, is just, this shows age-specific death rates for dogs, humans, and mice on the same time scale. Uh, and the basic conclusion is these actually, believe it or not, are statistically indistinguishable. But I'll use... Uh, the survival curves to do the same thing. And the bottom line is, is that when you look at the timing with which death occurs across different species, it basically occurs at the same rate. So the, the way to think of this is, and we were having this discussion last night uh, at dinner about dogs, 
And uh, think of it this way. When you go home and, and pet your dog uh, you know, on the head, normally you would say, how was your day today? Well, you shouldn't be saying, how was your day? You should be saying, how was your week? Because a day in the life of a human is roughly equivalent to a week in the life of a dog. And if you happen to have a pet mouse and you're patting it on the head, uh, you, you would be saying, how was your month? Uh, because one day in the life of a human is equivalent to roughly a month in the life, am I saying that right, uh, of a mouse. So um, the bottom line is, is, that, is that you need to, to, to control, you need to control for time uh, in order to understand uh, the relationship between death across species. So I'm going to pass over these, and I'm going to get right into this uh, second message that I, that I want to get across to you. Because as it turns out, Gompertz, Gompertz's concept of a law of mortality was rooted in something that he was unaware of at the time. I mean, evolution theory wasn't even around when Gompertz was was, uh, was writing his papers in 1825. And what I have discovered and what others have discovered is that once you look at the timing of death, and you, know, you saw that J-shaped curve and that consistent timing, and the point of lowest mortality was always at puberty, we now know why that happens. It, it, it's one of the few answers we actually have uh, in the field. And it comes right from evolution. And I like this quote from Dobzhansky. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And that is particularly the case when it comes to human aging and longevity. If you don't know evolution, you don't know aging, you don't know aging biology. And I was delighted to hear that virtually all the students that come out of this program have some training in evolution biology because it is absolutely critical. I'm going to give you the short course. Um, and so the real question that we're asking here is why are we transformed from this to this? This happens to be my family. So this is my daughter. This is my wife. This was her mother. And this little guy here was born, uh, what day is today? Friday? He was born last Saturday. So this is my grandson, my first. Um, so I was really excited to show this picture. <laughs> so <clears throat> why are we transformed? from this to this over a given time period. Why does it take 70, 80, 90 years to transform from this to this? Why doesn't it take 20 years or 30 years? Or why doesn't it take 150 or 200 years? Why does it take a prescribed time period? This is my dad, and this was my son uh, a few years ago. He's a little older now. But <clears throat> So what's interesting here, by the way, is that here's a picture of my dad at 95, right? Here's a picture of my dad at like 70. No different. He was on cruise control for a quarter century. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, it, that's, that's what happens to many people is that you get in, into these older age ranges, you take good care of yourself, you know, no major trauma, and you're basically on cruise control. For a while, not much, much happening. But look what happened to me and my son. You know, I look just a little bit older. Um, and he's, he looks a little bit older. And so, you know, there's these, these unusual transformations that take place. But the real question is, why does it take place over this prescribed time period? We know the answer to this question. Here's the answer. I'm going to use a race car analogy to explain why it is that we live as long as we do. Uh, now, this is perfect. I'm in the right place. This is the Indianapolis 500 race car analogy. You know, when I present this in Europe, they're going, well, what's the Indianapolis 500 race car uh, analogy? So I'll say the Grand Prix when I'm in Europe. But here it's perfect. This is the Indianapolis 500. Uh, and the engineers who build these cars build them to go a certain distance. And if they were to, if things go wrong, by the way, uh, while these cars are, you know, on the road, they bring them in, they replace whatever it is that needs to be replaced, they send them back out. And then they turn the engine off at 500 miles. Now, we, don't, we can't turn the engine off on our bodies. Uh, well, we do it only once uh, when death occurs. Um, but if you were to run these automobiles around the track uh, after the end of the race until they all failed, you would actually see a distribution of death times or failure times for these cars that would mimic 
almost identically that of living things. You would have some that would die very soon. You would have some Methuselah cars that would live out to a, a very long life. And there would be a distribution uh, along the way. And the things that go wrong with those cars are pretty much an accident of using them beyond the time that they're supposed to be used. Uh, you know this, of course, by operating your cars beyond their warranty period. When you operate your automobile beyond its three-year or whatever, five-year warranty period, and things start to fall off, you shouldn't be surprised because they weren't designed to last that long. Well, as it turns out, the same thing applies to living things, except the end of the race is not a measure of, of uh, distance. It's a measure of time. So here we need to, to, uh, to make it to our reproductive ages, produce offspring, ensure the reproductive success of our offspring, which, by the way, I just accomplished six days ago. Um, <laughs> this is important from an evolution, uh, evolutionary perspective, ensuring the reproductive success of your offspring. And what have we done? During the course of the 20th century, we pushed out survival very successfully into the post-reproductive region of the lifespan, where we get the privilege of not only living a long life, but we got the privilege of trading off uh, the infectious diseases that killed most people early for heart disease, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, and osteoarthritis, among other things that we don't like that are associated with growing older. There was a fundamental trade-off for longer life. I mean, you're right. It was a good thing. We, we wanted it. We got exactly what we want, an additional 30 years of life during the 20th century, but we had to pay a price for it. And the question is, where are we going now? Where are we headed uh, in the future? And I point out, by the way, that just like the automobile that wasn't engineered to fail, our bodies weren't engineered to fail. Our bodies were engineered to produce offspring, to ensure the reproductive success of our offspring, and to make sure we live long enough that our genes are passed on to the next generation. The diseases and disorders that we see at older regions of the lifespan are not our fault. I don't know if your doctor is telling you this. Um, it's not true. It is not our fault. Most of the things that go wrong with us as we, we grow older are a product of using our bodies beyond their warranty period their biological warranty period. Now, that doesn't mean we can't accelerate the uh, timing with which these events occur. And we, <clears throat> we, we do a lot of things to accelerate the timing with which bad events occur. So we eat poorly, we don't exercise, we smoke cigarettes, we become obese, we do things that shorten our lives. I have argued for quite some time in public health that the only control we have over our duration of life is to shorten it. And we exercise that control all the time. We do things that are harmful. But if you do everything right, if you eat right, you exercise, you, you do everything according to what your physician is telling you or your public health expert is telling you, I'm sorry to tell you this, but we will still grow old, we will still die, and there's a 75% chance it will be from heart disease, cancer, stroke. That's the way our body is designed. We are not going to be eliminating these diseases anytime soon, but we can reduce them and have succeeded in reducing them. All right, so this looks complicated. It's not. It actually relates to the timing with which death occurs. Uh, so what I've done is I've taken the human lifespan and I've divided it into these three regions, the pre-reproductive region between conception and puberty, the reproductive window between puberty and menopause in women, and the post-reproductive region of the lifespan past the, roughly the age of 50. And this is just another way of saying that as soon as we begin reproducing, the ability of natural selection to influence gene frequencies in subsequent generations declines. So forget about the details here. Here's the message. The message is, and this is the research that my colleague and I have been working on for years, is that we now know that duration of life of humans and other sexually reproducing species is calibrated to reproduction. It's calibrated to the onset and length of the reproductive window. So species that go through puberty early and have short reproductive windows live short lives. Species that go through puberty uh, late and menopause late and have long reproductive windows live longer lives. So let me be clear. Duration of life is calibrated to reproduction. The timing with which reproduction occurs. This is a genetically fixed attribute of the species. Okay? 
What that means, by the way, is that within species, uh, people that go, or females, let me stick to females for the moment, females that go through menopause late, natural menopause late, should live longer than women who go through natural menopause early. And we've seen this among uh, the study of, uh, of centenarians. So let me show you some examples. A mouse goes through puberty at about 30 days, and it lives about 1,000 days. A dog, that was my dog Sophie, goes through puberty at, uh, at about nine months, and they live about 5,000 days. Elephants live about 26,000 days. Humans, we go through pu puberty at about 11 to 12 years. We live about 29,000 days on average. Sea turtles go through puberty at 50 years of age. Puberty at 50 years of age. They live, can live for 150. And a bowhead whale, a mammal just like us, can live for 210 years, 77,000 days. So keep in mind, duration of life is calibrated to reproduction. All right, let me pass by this. So, um, how much time do I have left? Okay, yes. So do females who don't reproduce die earlier? All right, good question. The question was, do females that don't reproduce die earlier? So, as you might imagine, this has been studied by a number of researchers who looked at, at nuns. Um, and actually, uh, no, it's got nothing to do with whether you are producing offspring. It has nothing to do with whether you're having sex. That's irrelevant. It's the uh, genetically fixed program for the timing of puberty and menopause, regardless of what you do with what you, what you have. And what, it, what is it in men, the timing of course? All right, so I knew this, this question would come up. But I'm, I'm going to hold off. I'm going to hold off on that until we... Until we get to the question and answer, yeah. No, no evidence that menopause has changed at all. Puberty, uh, as you know, declined from about 18 in the early part of the 20th century. I'm sure you've got nutrition experts in the room here to about 11 to 12 today. It's likely to be associated with body fat and the hormones associated with body fat. The genetic potential for early puberty for puberty at 11 to 12 was always there. Yes? What can you do to change things? Uh, um, all right. So, so, uh, so that's the right question to be asking. What can you do to change things? Let me, let me save that for the end because that's the absolute right question to be asking. So I wanted to, my colleagues and I have been trying to find a way to communicate some of these concepts in a very straightforward way. And we published this article. You know, you know how, you know, for those of us that write in the field of aging, you have like your favorite paper that you wrote. Well, this was mine. We published this in Scientific American. Originally in 2001, it was republished in 2003 in the special issue on human evolution. And the title was, If Our Bodies Were Built to Last. My co-authors were Bruce Carnes, a good colleague, friend and colleague, and Bob Butler, who was the founding director of the National Institute on Aging, who uh, passed away just a, a few years ago. Uh, so I'm proud to mention his name uh, in, in his honor. So this, in this article, we ask the question, what if our bodies were designed better than they are now? What if they were designed for longer-term use? Because they're, they're not really designed for long-term use. They're designed for relatively short-term use. And like I said earlier, we use them beyond their warranty period. So we took a look at many of the problems that occur with us with the passage of time. Uh, these hinges down here, you know, this hinge and this hinge in the hip, you know, these hinges really were not meant to be used for a long, long time. We do use them much longer than, than intended. We lose muscle mass, sarcopenia. We lose bone uh, uh, mass with the passage of time. There's a whole suite of problems that occur in these bodies with the passage of time. And so we went through one at a time uh, and essentially re-engineered them to, to make them operate better. Um, and now, I'll be honest with you, when we were working on this paper, uh, we were working with an artist. And so we said, the artist said, what do you want this animal to look like? And we said, we don't really know. We're just going to give you one body part at a time that we want to change, and then you create what this thing is going to look like.